Welcome to the Power in Motion podcast, the show for women who want to develop a kinder relationship with their body so you can feel healthy, happy, and confident without restricting food, doing torturous exercise, or constantly worrying about the number on the scale. I'm your host, Kim Hagel, size inclusive fitness specialist and certified non diet health and life coach specializing in body image. This podcast is here to provide weight neutral, health at every size aligned information and coaching on sustainable habits and mindset shifts so you can feel your very best in the body you have right now. Let's lace up our runners and go for a walk while we chat. Well, hello there, friend, and welcome to episode 51 of the Joyful Movement Show. It's Kim here, your host, personal trainer, and registered holistic nutritionist on a mission to help women find what moves them through movement and eating all from a body respecting perspective so that we can feel healthy, strong, and confident in our own skin. I'm so excited about this episode and our interview today with our very special guest. Sabrina Rogers is a licensed mental health counselor, intuitive eating and body image expert, and recovering perfectionist. And she's here to chat with us today about emotional eating, which is a very timely episode and I think an always relevant episode. Um, I recently asked a question on my Instagram stories a week or two ago about do you ever feel like you're addicted to food, (laughs) right? Like where we try and eat, quote, good all week long and then plan to have maybe a little treat on the weekend and find ourselves going totally off the rails, eating all the things we tried to avoid all week with absolutely no sense of control and then feeling so guilty and ashamed after. And that can make us feel like we're addicted to food. You're not, by the way, and that's something that we're definitely going to talk about on a future episode coming up in November. But back to this story, when I asked that question, some of the responses that came back had to do with emotional eating. Uh, One woman in particular said, I feel like I'm addicted to food because I've always been told I'm emotional. I'm an emotional eater. I can't control myself around food when I'm upset. And then the two of us ended up having a really powerful conversation over the DMs about how food is really meant to be an emotional experience and how we're conditioned as such since we're teeny tiny babies. And yet as we become older, we're told that this is bad. And we feel this internal conflict because food is tied to every family event and celebration that we go to, like from weddings and funerals, holidays, birthdays, retirement, on and on. You can't escape food and the emotional connection to it. But the sense is you're supposed to be able to keep it under control. So I'm really excited to dig into this topic more with Sabrina. I'm not going to give it all away here in the intro. A little bit more about her. Uh, Sabrina, like I said, is a mental health counselor, intuitive eating and body image expert, and recovering perfectionist. After healing her own disordered eating and body image issues, she's helping women make the shift to intuitive eating and body acceptance. Sabrina provides one-to-one and group counseling to individuals in Iowa and one-to-one and group coaching through her program, Happily Healthily Ever After, which is a 20-week online program to help perfectionistic women look and feel like they have their shit together. Sabrina is also the host of the Emotional Eating Therapist Show podcast. So inside this episode, we chatted about how we're all emotional eaters, why we turn to food to cope with difficult feelings, and how food does make us feel better, but how we're conditioned to believe this is a bad thing, and then how mindfulness and curiosity can help us cope with our emotions with or without food, and to reduce the guilt associated with emotional eating. There are some golden nuggets in here that will really help shift your perspective about emotional eating and some great tools that you can implement today. So grab a pen and paper. If you're home, you might want to take some notes as we go along and I hope you enjoy. Hey friend, I totally get how lonely it can feel as you're trying to heal your relationship with movement. When your social media feed is littered with fitspo, before and afters and weight loss challenges, it can be really hard to figure out what moves you. 
I know that community is one of the main motivating forces and that being surrounded by like-minded women on the same journey can be really helpful in making lasting, sustainable changes. So if you want less Fitspo and more body kindness, come join us inside my free Facebook group, The Joyful Movement Show Community. Inside, you'll be surrounded by women just like you who are exploring how to move for more than just weight loss. I'm in there too, answering questions and cheering you on. Come join us inside the Joyful Movement Show community, and I'll see you on the inside. Hey, Sabrina, welcome to the Joyful Movement Show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Oh, it's truly an honor. I am so excited to get into this topic. We're going to be diving into emotional eating today, which is your specialty. I know you're going to tell us all about that, but I think there's many listeners who are going to resonate with this topic. And um, I think, yeah, we can judge ourselves pretty harshly for our emotional eating habits. I want to talk about that. And uh, yeah, I don't want to give it all away, but um I'm so thrilled to have you here and where this conversation is going to go. But before we get into all of that emotional eating stuff, one question that I really like to ask all of my guests when they come on the Joyful Movement show is, what does Joyful Movement mean to you? Such a beautiful question and I think such a beautiful concept to begin with. Because I think so many times, especially being in the fitness industry, um, being in I don't know, just the times that we are in, we have really just sort of embraced this idea that the only time we need to be moving our body is when we're exercising to burn calories, when we're exercising to punish it because we, we ate too much or, you know, we need to modify it so that it looks a certain way. Mm -hmm. And I, I was definitely there for a lot of my life, unfortunately. And as we've talked before, you and I, I went through this period of probably about a year where I had to stop almost all types of movement other than some walking here and there, because I needed to make sure for my own mental health and physical health that I was moving in a way that brought me joy rather than any other reason to move. Yeah. I had to really move away from that exercise punishment mentality to more of that joyful movement of figuring out how does my body like to move? Mm -hmm. Because I I had always moved my body in ways that other people told me to do it, whether it was the trainer at the gym or the fitness instructor or the gym class teacher. Mm -hmm. I never took the time to say, oh, my body doesn't like that, but it likes this. Mm -hmm. So I think for me personally, my, my body loves to walk. It loves to run and it loves to dance. Mm. And, and some days, and this is where that joyful movement and having the freedom to be intuitive with the movement of some days, my body's like, yeah, let's go for a run. Like, let's go. We got, we got some energy. We want to get it out there. Let's do this. And other days it's like, no, no, I'm kind of just more like relax. Let's just go for a nice stroll. And then other days it's like, no, we got to like groove sister. (laughs) I love that. And that really is the beauty of intuitive movement and being in your body and being able to pick up on those signals of when your body's asking for a little more or to just chill or groove it out. Like, right. Like it's so much more fun when we, when we can pick up on those signals and honor those signals and then, yeah participate in movement in a way that is in alignment, of course, it's going to be a lot more fun. So glad that you discovered that for yourself. Okay, so I love your tagline, that you help perfectionist women look and feel like they have their shit together. I think that's amazing, because isn't that kind of what we all want? Yes. Yeah. And I, like, I was thinking about this. And it's it was one of those things like the light bulb just went off. Cause I kept thinking like, man, everybody tells me how like, oh, Sabrina, how do you do everything? How do you do this? How do you do this? How do you do it all? Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, I don't really do it all. You have no idea what's going on behind the scenes. They're like, oh, but you always look like you have your shit together. And I went, oh, if you only knew. So, uh, yeah. And that's the thing. We all like to look like we have our shit together, but yeah, either behind the scenes, it's complete chaos or you have help. 
right? Yeah. <laughs> it's one yeah. or the other. So tell us a little bit more about like what it is that you do and how you got to be doing the work that you do and how you help women get their shit together. Yeah. So I am a licensed mental health counselor here in Iowa and also a mind body eating coach. So I can practice in multifacets, which is great. Now I'm not just limited to Podunk, Iowa with, with what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. A big part of it, and we'll talk more about this with the emotional eating piece, is helping women to really just embrace who and where they are in the moment rather than trying to live up to that image that we have in our head of how things are supposed to be. I, I love whimsy. I love fairy tales and I often have my head in the clouds, but I also know to keep my feet on the ground and, and when to fantasize about what. And so a lot of it is helping other women embrace that of kind of it, tuning in to what their body is saying, tuning in to what they need rather than what other people are telling them they need. Mm-hmm. I think that's, that's such an important distinction, right? Like mm-hmm. when you, there's so many pressures in the world to, to do it all, to be it all. And I love how you talked about that, that fantasy, like we, we can often fall into that trap of fantasizing about having everything in life, doing it all. And it's okay to fantasize and it's okay to have goals and dreams, but keeping ourselves grounded in the moment too, and connecting to what's really important and relevant for us. I think that's a very important distinction to make. So I know a big part of your job is in working on this whole emotional eating um, concept. I don't want to say problem because we're going to talk about that whole thing in a little bit. Um, And you even have a podcast called the emotional eating therapist show. So one thing I learned from you early on when I started following you was that we are all emotional eaters. And I had to think about that at first because I was like, I'm not an emotional eater. Like I'm not this person that eats when I'm sad or lonely or bored. Like I don't do that. But can you, can you kind of explain how we are all emotional eaters? Yeah. Well, first of all, we're, we're humans, at least, you know, to my knowledge, we're all humans which means we all have emotions. We are always feeling something. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we get kind of put into those categories of good emotions, bad emotions, positive emotions, negative emotions. Mm. And just like our thoughts are just words, our emotions are just feelings. They're not good or bad. It's our perspective that sort of gives them that good or bad quality in our minds. And looking at it more from like a, uncomfortable versus comfortable, Mm. I think really helps because yes, there are some emotions that feel really pleasant to have. Like it feels really great to feel love and joy and happiness. And sometimes it doesn't feel so comfortable to experience anger or jealousy or sadness, but taking off that sort of morality of it Mm -hmm. helps to just give it more of this neutral aspect So if we think of it that way, we're always feeling something. And so unless you're hooked up to a feeding tube, when you eat, you're emotionally eating. Mm -hmm. Like if, if you eat because you're sad or you're lonely, yeah, that's emotional eating. But if you're eating to celebrate your kid's last baseball game, or you're, you know, you're eating to celebrate your anniversary with your partner. Mm -hmm. Those, those are all emotions too. We just don't think of it as the emotional eating because Mm. it's not that uncomfortable emotion that we usually associate with it. Right. So we are conditioned to think that it's the uncomfortable emotions when we eat for those uncomfortable emotional reasons, that that's a, that's a bad thing, or we shouldn't do that. But if we're eating for a positive emotion or experience like a celebration um, or just, you know, being together with family and making memories and nostalgia and all of that, like that's okay. But what you're saying is our emotions are all just neutral. And every time we sit down to eat, we're feeling something. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So can you tell me a little more about then why are our emotions so connected to our eating behavior? Like, why do we 
eat emotionally. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, this one, this one might be like one of those, like, ah, duh moments. (laughs) Cause it was for me too. Um, it's very natural for us to turn to food to cope because think about what happens when, when we're born or when we have a baby, the baby comes out, we come out red faced, screaming, crying, after we, you know, some of us get cleaned up, but at some point, almost immediately after coming out of the womb, what are we given? A boob or a bottle? Mm -hmm. So we're taught from day one that eating to cope works, that eating is a natural and easy and efficient way to calm our emotions. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that that, that, to me, that's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It's our perspective. It's that guilt that we feel after we've engaged in emotional eating, because oftentimes what we're doing when we're engaging in eating to cope with those more uncomfortable emotions is we're, we're mindlessly eating. We're not aware of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And then we get to the end of the bag of chips and wonder where in the world it went, or we Mm -hmm. get to the end of the cookie jar and have no idea where all the cookies went. Mm -hmm. And then that guilt starts to set in. And I think that's why we have such this negative connotation on emotional eating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And why do you think we feel that guilt? Unpack that a little bit more for me. Like, Mm -hmm. why do we, why do we feel so badly about ourselves when we engage in this behavior? I think it, it's kind of twofold. One diet culture Mm. of we we're taught from diet culture, from patriarchy, that we need to look a certain way to be worthwhile. And if we're constantly engaging in behaviors that don't get us closer to that, than ideal, Mm -hmm. we're made to think that we're bad, that we're not worthwhile. So I think there's a lot of stuff wrapped up in diet culture and staying away from that, which is a whole nother (laughs) topic. And also it's kind of this Uh, self-punishment thing Mm -hmm. of on some level, a lot of us think that we deserve to feel bad Mm -hmm. either because we were taught that as a young child, because we're taught that through diet culture. And we don't realize that we don't have to feel this way. Yeah. We don't have to feel bad about our behaviors. We can look at it from a place of curiosity and compassion rather than judgment and blame. Mm -hmm. And really just look at it and be like, oh, well, that's interesting. I wonder why I did that. Mm -hmm. Rather than, oh, I'm such a bad person for eating the entire bag of Oreos. Yeah, because when we do that, it really doesn't set us up or empower us to to dig into it and and make a change if we desire Mm -hmm. to at all, which is completely up to the individual, right? But when we're punishing ourselves and feeling guilty and ashamed, it's not it's not very empowering. You're kind of stuck there. And I, I don't know. I just want to preface this, that I don't think that a lot of people do that intentionally. I don't Mm -hmm. think we look like, Oh, I'm going to punish myself. Let me reach into the cupboard and and grab the bag of chips and then sit here and beat myself up about it. I think it just happens because it's so ingrained. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We don't know any different. Mm -hmm. I mean, we reach for the bag of chips, like you say, because we're looking for comfort right? Mm -hmm. Or whatever the food is, it doesn't have to be chips. But like you say, we were, we've been conditioned since birth, that food is comforting. So when we go for food, when we're feeling emotions, that's what we're looking for. But we don't allow ourselves to feel that emotion when we eat, right? We go straight into this is bad. I'm and I'm a horrible person that I've done this. I think that brings up a really good point, Kim, is that one, we're so in ingrained to not feel, you know, we're a bunch of floating heads because we've mm-hmm. disconnected from our bodies and our emotions that, that we don't want to feel those uncomfortable feelings. So we mm-hmm. push it off and push it off and avoid it and grabbing the bag of chips, grabbing cookies, grabbing anything helps soothe that right away. You know, mm-hmm. it's eating really turns on the parasympathetic nervous system, which helps us relax. So it's natural. Mm-hmm. We're feeling stressed. We're feeling activated. We reach for something to eat and almost immediately we start to relax. But what happens when you keep, this is 
So my mom, she was amazing, so smart. In like first or second grade, it was really cool for the boys to chase the girls at recess. <laughs> and I kept complaining to her about the, the boys chasing and I didn't like it. And she looked at me and she said with a flat stare, like, if you don't run, they can't chase you, Sabrina. <laughs> oh. And I think the same applies for our emotions of we're constantly running from mm-hmm. our emotions because we don't want to feel them. Mm-hmm. But if we, if we just stop, for five minutes, not even five minutes most of the time. Mm -hmm. But if we just stop, notice what we're feeling, acknowledge that, Ooh, this doesn't feel that comfortable. Okay. What am I, what am I supposed to learn? What am I supposed to hear from this message from my body that the emotions stop chasing us, but we have to stop running from them first. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Cause our emotions are like our radar to let us know how our, our thoughts are doing. And there's something to explore when our emotions are activated. And yeah, like you said, I think it's interesting that pretty much everything we do in life is to try to feel better. Like that's just what our primitive brain wants is to, to feel good. Right. So yeah. when we reach for food on some level, we know it does make us feel better. Like you said, there's this whole biological thing that happens with our parasympathetic nervous system and dopamine's released and all that, like pleasure happens when we eat food, but then we're not wired to want it. Like we, we chase feeling good, but then we feel like this is a bad way to, to get that feeling. So in comes the guilt and the shame and all of that stuff. When it's, when we use food to kind of numb out or avoid feeling something, it's very short lived. It's mm-hmm. fleeting mm-hmm. because those dopamine spikes from the food only last for so long, mm-hmm. which then it easily becomes a habit and this pattern. Whereas there are so many other ways, including mm-hmm. food. Like I, mm-hmm. I'm totally cool with if you want to choose to eat when you're feeling anything, great, go ahead and do that. Mm-hmm. Just make sure you're mindful about it. Um, but when we constantly like are trying to avoid, Mm -hmm. we're going to constantly try and keep avoiding and to keep feeling good and use those things that are short lived rather than, you know, engaging in other things that help us feel good for a longer period of time, or just being okay with the idea that it's okay to be uncomfortable sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're saying it's not such a bad thing that we engage in emotional eating. It's just staying mindful about the process and knowing that there's more work to do as well. Yeah. Yeah. I don't see it as a bad thing at all. I think we just, if we're going to do this, just like anything, if you're going to go, if you're going to use walking as a coping skill, Mm -hmm. you know, you don't want to be walking down the street on your phone while you're walking because now your, your attention is divided. Yes. So if, and if you're going to get together with your girlfriends to chit chat or have a glass of wine, you're hopefully not going to be scrolling on your phone either. Mm-hmm. So why not do that when we're using food to cope, you know, put the phone away, put the electronics away, put the TV away mm-hmm. and just be in the moment with that food. Mm-hmm. Do you have any tips for helping to be in the moment with food? Cause that mm-hmm. can be a completely new concept <laughs> yeah. to like, how do, how do I do that? Yeah. So I go back to intuitive eating and the three S's from, uh, Triboli and Rush. And that's slow down, mm. slow down. You know, our taste buds are in our mouth, not our stomach. Mm-hmm. So when we are like just shoveling food in to feel better, yeah, it, we get that immediate release, mm-hmm. but then, you know, he's like, Oh, I didn't even taste that. Yeah. So really slow down. And that's where putting the electronics away, being in the moment with it, sitting, sitting down at a table or even your desk. Cause I know a lot of busy entrepreneurs and moms are like, okay, I, you know, I need to keep working. Yeah. On the fly. Yeah. No, sit, sit down Mm -hmm. and eat, slow it down. Taking a couple just like deep breaths before we start to eat Mm -hmm. really helps too. And if you're into prayer or meditation, just saying a few words of gratitude for whatever plant or animal that has given its life to produce this food Mm -hmm. to then give you energy has been really amazing for myself and a lot of the clients Mm -hmm. that I work with. Mm -hmm. So those, those are some ideas on how to slow down, then Mm -hmm. eat sensually. 
Mm-hmm. We have five senses. Use all of them while you're eating. Mm-hmm. Taste. No, pick out one of my favorite games to play with myself, especially if I'm eating at a restaurant or like my friends have cooked, is to try and pick out the different ingredients. Ah, uh, yes. There was there was one time my best friend, who's uh, also my office mate, made some. I think she made blondies, and I was eating it as I was driving home. And I'm like, there's something, there's something in this that I can't peg. <laughs> I couldn't figure it out. So I, I sent her a text message. I'm like, did you use butter or margarine? And she went margarine. I went, I knew it. <laughs> She's like, what? I'm like, I can tell the difference if you use butter or margarine. Just That's because cool. you, if, if you pay attention enough, your tongue starts to be able to differentiate that stuff. That's yeah. a pretty cool skill to so, have. Everybody can have it. <laughs> got to slow down and be mindful, Mm -hmm. Uh, but notice how it feels in your mouth. Mm -hmm. Notice the texture or the temperature. Notice if it, you know, crunches as you bite it. Notice if the tastes change as it starts to dissolve in your mouth. Mm -hmm. And then the last of the three S's is savor. Savor. And Mm. that's where we come back to really enjoy all of the flavors that are in the food. Mm-hmm. And if you, if it doesn't taste good, stop eating it. You can stop. Yeah. Yeah. You are not obligated to continue. Mm-hmm. I think that's really helpful, right? Cause as you say, sometimes when we, we know we're going to eat emotionally, we do it sneakily in secret as quickly as possible. And you're right. We don't even taste it. Mm-hmm. So take a second, slow down, use your senses, savor it. And then, you know, you can allow the pleasure that that food has to offer you Mm -hmm. and the comfort that it brings and your mind is clearer. So then there's that invitation to go deeper and look, what else do I need? Yeah. When I think that, you know, being a little bit more present and noticing when that kind of need to cope has, has left also helps because so many times we get into more of that habit of binging or overeating when we're trying to use food to numb out. But if we're really paying attention to all of those three things, using all of our senses, we'll start to notice like, oh, I do feel less stressed. I do feel less need to eat, to cope or to cope at all. Like Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not really feeling this anymore. So it really helps us to stop the eating, which also helps to, you know, then we don't have as much ammunition to beat ourselves up with. Mm. There's that. Right. Yeah. So then what's the next step when a person can, can take that time to eat mindfully? What do they do next? What are some other ways to cope with our mm-hmm. emotions besides mm-hmm. food? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question because yes, food, food can be used. Great. Yep. Totally in favor of that. Mm -hmm. Love it. But also find other things that help, whether that's movement, walking, talking with a friend, you know, and it's so, again, we have to be more intuitive on this because what works for me to cope Mm -hmm. with my emotions might not work for you and might not work for your listeners. But some of my favorite things are um, if I, if I am noticing that I need to like dissociate, if I need to avoid feeling something, mm-hmm. I'll listen to a book. I'll go for a walk. I'll turn on some music. Mm-hmm. I'll do, I'll do something. And if I'm noticing that I, I'm, I need to feel something, you know, whether it's like the, the boredom or the loneliness or sadness, and I want to feel something else then I, you know, I can go back to my list of coping skills. And again, reading a book, music, those are always helpful. Or even just putting on like, you know, Insight Timer is a great app for this, putting on a five minute meditation Mm -hmm. and just sitting in the feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. Like we often, we don't want to sit in our uncomfortable feelings. Mm -hmm. Right. But if we can be with it long enough for it to, to shed its message to us, share its message with Mm -hmm. us that it wants to send, then there's possibility on the other side of that emotion. Yeah. Yeah. 
And I think they're like looking at this on, on ways to cope and manage your emotions and your thoughts because they go hand in hand. We can look at things of in the moment mm. of, you know, okay, this is happening. I'm feeling this right now. I need to do something about it. And then more of those like long, longer term mm -hmm. coping skills. And I think mm -hmm. like some sort of daily practice is great for that long term, whether it's mm -hmm. prayer, meditation, um, even just some gratitude first thing in the morning, some sort of movement, whether it's yoga or walking or running or whatever brings you joy. Mm -hmm. Those are great for those longer stretches so that we don't have those like ups and downs of emotions. Mm -hmm. And then more in the moment, um, like you can do anything that brings you joy. But another thing that um, is really I don't know, popular with my clients is the five senses grounding activity. Mm -hmm. I love it. You mm -hmm. can explain that for those who aren't familiar. Yep. And the order of things doesn't really matter. So I always say that because, you know, perfectionistic women were like, oh, I can't remember what, what I'm supposed to do next. And then yep. we don't do it. So just if you can remember your five senses, you got this. Right. So when you're feeling stressed and you need to kind of bring back to your body, when you need to ground a little bit more, Look around and name five things that you can see. Mm -hmm. Feel four different things. So like right now I could feel my keyboard. I can feel my desk. I can feel my hair. Anything that you can feel, anything that you can touch. Three things that you can hear. So I can hear the birds and the bugs and myself talking. Two things that you can smell. Or if you're kind of in a neutral odor zone, two of your favorite smells. Or having, having something that you can, you know, like a perfume bottle or a little piece of gum or mint in your purse or pocket that you can pull out to kind of help turn that on. Mm -hmm. And then your, what, something you can taste, one thing you can taste. Mm -hmm. And if you can't taste anything, maybe having a piece of gum or a mint that you can put in to help give you something to taste. Yeah. Yeah. It just brings you right back to that present moment and mm -hmm. gets you out of the, out of those thoughts that are chasing around in your head and yeah brings that mental clarity i i like the balance between those regular everyday self-care activities to, you know keep our, our well-being as a priority and a focus and then those in the moment strategies we can use when we're when we're activated as you say i know i've found like working with a coach and having someone to chat to on a regular basis really has helped my well-being overall and helped me to to just keep on top of all of that and, and keep those tools in the forefront. And I know that that's how you work with women. So tell us a little bit more about the program that you offer and how you support women on their emotional eating journey. Yeah. So I have a 20 week coaching program, which has a, a beautiful blend of one-to-one -one coaching every other week. And then every week we get together as a group. So you've got the support of me as your coach. But then you also have the support of other women who are going through this with you, which, you know, that's how we met. We met through a mentorship program and some of the friendships that I've made from mentorship programs, like ours have just been like, they're the most significant relationships in my life. Mm -hmm. And so having that camaraderie, I think is really special, which is why I've included it. And we go through everything from intuitive eating, really learning how to get in your body and being comfortable in your body and increasing your ability to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I teach a lot of mindset work, specifically self-coaching, which is, is great because you can do it anywhere. You like, it's nice to have that guide to help you walk through it and then to bounce ideas off of, but you know, if, if you don't have access to me or after the 20 weeks are over, this is something you can keep doing. It's something I do almost on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. how we, we change a lot of our, our thoughts. And that's how we can change a lot of all of the behaviors down the road. Yeah. We also talk a little bit about joyful movement, intuitive movement. Not, not a lot. That's your specialty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know, then, there's crossover. Like we're all kind of, yeah. we're all on the same team here, right? Just helping yeah. women to be comfortable with who they are and love the body that they have. And and move past diet culture. So, you know, if we yeah. teach some of the same things, you heard it here, it's not competition. Nope, it is not competition. In fact, when when we're doing the same things, but in our own way, mm -hmm. 
you know, it, it just, it adds to it. Mm -hmm. 100%. I'm better because of you and you're better because of me. I absolutely agree. Couldn't have said mm -hmm. it better. Okay. And then I know you also have a couple of free resources for those who are listening that they can go get. So we mentioned your podcast. It's the Emotional Eating Therapist Show, and it's on all the podcast platforms. And you have a free resource that people can go get on your website. Am I right? Uh, yeah, I do. And, you know, after listening to this, you might still be like wondering, well, you know, am I really an emotional eater? Uh, yeah. So I have, I have a quiz that will help you decide if you're an emotional eater. Um, and hint, you probably are. <laughs> Uh, but then it's also got some ideas for you on, on what you can do about that. That's amazing. Great. And for those who want to keep following you, Sabrina, after they've listened to this episode, where can they connect with you on social media? Yeah. So I'm on Instagram at Sabrina Rogers, LMHC and Facebook, which I think is still listed under healthily ever after under the program name. So Instagram would be your preferred platform more like more than likely. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. Well, Hey, this has been a really great conversation. Um, I know I've learned so much from you in the time that we've known each other about emotional eating. And I, I, I hope I can speak for all of our listeners, but I know just for myself, it really neutralized things for me. It took a lot of that guilt and shame away, just knowing that we are all emotional eaters. Like we are humans and this is what we do and that it's not a bad thing. So I really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing that message with, with our listeners. Yeah. Thanks for letting me come on and share it with everybody. It's been a pleasure. Mine too. Take care, Sabrina. Thanks. Well, I hope you got lots of value out of that interview. As I said, all of Sabrina's resources are linked up in the show notes. So go and check all that out and make sure you give her a follow. Also be sure to go hop on over to her podcast as well, which is the Emotional Eating Therapist Show. If you liked this episode and want to dig deeper into your relationship with food, stay tuned for November's episodes here on the Joyful Movement Show. I'll be doing a four-part series about intuitive eating. We'll be talking about how to tell if you're still dieting or not, those sneaky ways that healthy lifestyles can masquerade as diets. I'll introduce you to intuitive eating, including what it is and what it isn't, and a lot of the common fears that women have about getting started with intuitive eating. So stick around for that. We don't talk about food all that much here because this podcast is mostly about movement. That's what people generally come here to learn about, but the two really go hand in hand, and I do receive a lot of questions about food. So I thought it would be helpful to chat about some of those concerns over a few episodes. So that starts November 1st and runs for the month. I'll look forward to seeing you then. In the meantime, next week's episode is our anniversary episode celebrating one year of the Joyful Movement Show. And I'll be answering your questions about literally everything. There's still time to submit your questions for the Ask Me Anything show. There's a link to my email in the show notes. All right. So from Sabrina and I, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you loved this episode, please share it and tag us on your social media with your big takeaways or take a moment to leave a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. They really help get this show into the ears of the people who need it. So I'll see you back here Monday for the Ask Me Anything one year anniversary show. In the meantime, be well and here's to your radiant vitality. Thanks for tuning into the Power in Motion podcast today. If you love what you're learning here, then I invite you to take the next step of embodying these concepts into your own life so that you can live your healthiest, happiest life and never again feel held back by your body. Coaching is the fastest, most efficient pathway to taking what you know in your head to actually applying it and seeing results. Whether you're looking to make changes around movement, food, body image, or all three, I'm here to help you nurture a kind, respectful, and trusting relationship with your body so you can feel your very best. Click the link in the show notes to book a free consultation and together we'll uncover what's getting in the way of you having the results you want. You'll leave this call knowing exactly what you need to work on and together we'll explore whether one of my coaching offers is a good fit for you. I can't wait to meet you.